guys, I'm Megan Barker. Welcome to Jammin' and Jammies. We are sitting down with some of our favorite music creators and industry leaders. We're going to find out how they got where they are and get some valuable insights into the music world. You can watch the interviews online or tune into the podcast. Just check out jamminandjammies.com for all the details. Today, I'm really excited to be sitting down with Jay Knowles. He is a Nashville-based, award-winning, number one hit songwriter with cuts by country stars like Luke Bryan, Blake Shelton, Alan Jackson, Lainey Wilson, David Nail. We could be here all day. He's also the co-founder of a new online portal for music industry insiders called Whale Farm. I can't wait to hear more about that. So let's welcome him. Hey, Jay, how you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. It's quite an introduction. It's quite a mouthful, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm uh, really excited to have you here. Thanks for being here. Um, do you want to just start by telling everyone where you're from and how did you get into music? Um, yeah, I, I grew up, I was, I was born in Texas, but I grew up here in Nashville. We moved here when I was about six years old, I think. Uh, my dad uh, is a guitar player, John Knowles, and he had met uh, Chet Atkins uh, out in Dallas somewhere. And um, Chet had encouraged him to come to Nashville to play guitar and be a part of the, the Nashville music, whatever that was at the time. And so for some reason, uh, my mom thought that was a good idea too. So we loaded up and moved to Nashville um, back then. And so I kind of had been around uh, all of that stuff since then in some, in some fashion or another, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's what, uh, that's what brung me here. Uh, it was not my choice. But, uh, <laughs> that's so cool though. I mean, name dropping things like Chet Atkins, that must've been really cool. So um, how long did it take until you started playing music? Um, I, it's funny. I was sort of against it. And I was, I mean, my dad and I had written a couple songs as a kid. Uh, there was talking about um, dropping names as a youngster. I was funny. I was, uh, I remember going over to Chet's office. I was not impressed by most of that stuff as a <laughs> seven, eight year old kid. Right. But one time uh, my dad um, talked to me, was, was, I was kind of, kind of toting along with my dad and, uh, and we we're over at Chet's office and Shel Silverstein was there. Stop. and I lost my mind then I was like that because that because he was such a wreck because you know the, the back of those books the giving tree and the right. uh, and the world oh, sidewalk ends and all those a books. light in the yeah, attic was my exactly. favorite exactly all the backs had that big picture of him and his bald head and the thing and that's what he looked like in real life and so wow. I was like oh my dad's like dad that's Joe Silverstein we need to <laughs> play it and then of course now I'm very bad at uh, pitching my songs or wanting to play my songs for people but at that time I had no uh no fear. So I was like, Dad, we need to play in that song we made. We need to play in that. So I, we made Shel Silverstein listen to a song that I had. Did had you written. really? And, um, and Chet was like, that's pretty good. We should put it and make it look, you know. So it was that kind of, I think that seed got planted early on uh, that it was a thing that you could do. And it's <sighs> kind of cool. Um, but, I, but I was kind of reticent to play the guitar or learn an instrument. I mean, I kind of took some piano lessons and I kind of took some guitar lessons, but it really wasn't until I was kind of toward the end of high school when I realized like if you play electric guitar, you could be in a band yeah. and, and that kind of thing. And um, I had some friends who were in a band and uh, two of the guys were graduating and they knew I knew about guitars and I could maybe had played at one point. And they just said, hey, Jay, if you can learn how to play, you know, uh, I fought the law and white room and all these songs by the time Tom goes to UVA, then you could be in our band. And so I asked my dad to buy me a electric guitar and uh, kind of just started doing it from that point. It was not like some kind of, I guess it's kind of like if your dad's a baseball player, you know how to throw a baseball. Right. And so it loved the, I got mediocre fast at it, I guess, because I had been around it so much. Was your dad excited but, when you asked him to buy an electric guitar? <laughs> I think so. He was a little confused i think i'd stolen one of his guitars and hidden it under my bed and kind of halfway learned how to play before that and he's like wait a minute you know how to play the guitar now and i was like yeah i think so and so i showed him you know wow. but he was he was always encouraging without being like you need to follow in the the path of the thing you know because he, he was so good at it that it never occurred to me to be good at it too i think that's why i ended up picking it i mean I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fine guitar player but i'm not good <laughs> you know, so uh, I could never, but uh, so I think that's why I picked a different part of this. I have a feeling you're being humble, but we'll allow it. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, do you, uh, do you remember like the song or the artist or the moment that you knew you wanted to be a songwriter? Um, 
it's funny. I mean, the the kind of the thing that kind of flipped the switch for me when I was probably 16, 15, 16 was uh, that band um, uh, Dire Straits and the guy Mark Knopfler. Yeah. Was in it. And it seems like all I do is talk about Chet now, but that's but it was true. Like I'd seen him on TV, uh, Knopfler on TV, on MT on MTV back when MTV played music videos. Yeah. Like that's, that's what YouTube does now. Um, and I was just like, man, this guy's cool and a thing, and I get it. And and I showed it to my dad. I was like, hey, this is this guy's cool. And my dad was like, oh yeah, I met him last week. He was over at Chet's office. And so all of a sudden I was. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, there's rock stars and there's my dad who was, you know, especially when you're 15, 16, he was not, my dad was not cool. And now he's hanging out with these people. And so it kind of made it all seem, again, sort of the the leap. I, I, I feel like most people who live in other cities who are not around this, like, I don't know how they even think that, like, it's just that this, how, how stupid do you have to be to live <laughs> in some town in Nebraska and be like, I want to be like those people. Yeah. But I grew up around enough of it that it just seemed like a job you could have. And, yeah. And, uh, it was and normal. It, it, yeah. And it was, it was, it was just like, if you wanted to be that and you could do that. And, and one of my dad's uh, good kind of guitar playing friends was a guy named uh, David Conrad, who was a big publisher here in the town at the time. And he was just like, Jay, you're pretty clever. You should try writing songs. I was like, okay. You know, it was just, it, it, it never, it was never a, uh, yeah, I understand, you know, it's so, yeah. and then all of a sudden I was just, you know, I was just doing it because I knew people who did. And, yeah. Yeah. But, Everything you're saying is resonating with me on a personal level. Cause my dad wrote songs too, and he knew Dave Conrad. And so you're okay. mentioning, but I mean, I wasn't hanging around with Chet Atkins that, that that's that's or Shel Silverstein. Those stories are, <laughs> are cooler than mine, but I understand what you mean about, you know, you kind of feel like it's normal and I don't think most people realize uh, when they grow up in it, how lucky you are. So, um, yeah. so Dave Conrad said you were a good songwriter. Was that kind of like the, the, well, it's funny. He said, I could, he said, I could be. <laughs> and and uh, and anyone who knows David from back then, he's you know he's a great guy, but he was not known for being effusive about songs. Uh, I know uh, the story that somebody told me one time is that the, he he was the guy who uh, he was the first person who heard uh, "I Can't Make You Love Me" after Alan Shamblin and Mike Reed had written it because oh, wow. they you know wrote, they wrote it and then they came into the office and Dave was Mike Reed's publisher and Mike Reed played it for him and he goes, "Oh, that's pretty good." does it need a bridge? And that was, you know, his, you know, cause he always was like trying, of course, then he like took that tape and gave it to Bonnie Ray and got it. You know I mean? It wasn't, they was very good at his job, but part of being sure. good at his job was not liking songs. And so I remember when I was in college and this is really how I kind of was really learned how to do it a lot is uh, he knew I was writing songs. So he said, like, well, come by the office and play me some of your songs. And so I sat down with him and before I um, started, he said, okay, now I want you to know, like the way I'm going to treat this is I'm not, uh, I'm not your dad's pal, Dave. I'm not uncle Dave who took you on a camp out one time back in, like, I'm going to treat you like I'm paying you money to write songs for me and I need you to make good songs and I'm going to be just like anybody else. And so I played him these songs and he just like shredded them. It was like, no, I've heard this idea too many times. I've done this a bunch. This bridge is kind of interesting. The hook is, t but you're not doing it. It just was like, and yeah. at the end, I was just like, blah. <laughs> but then the only nice thing he said was, come back in six more months when you got another patch of songs and playing for me again. I want to hear where you're going from there. So it was like, that was it. It was like, I, there was never a, he didn't, he didn't coddle me at all. He just yeah. brutalized me, but also treated me like a grown up, even yeah. when I was way before I was able to be treated like a grown up. So it was very, it was really helpful to, to do that. Well, you must have known at that point that that's what you wanted to do, because I think a lot of people would give up the first time they're shredded like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what made me think. I think I was stubborn, too. I was like, well, <laughs> I'll show him. <laughs> yes. so, but some of it was that, too, like because uh, after he abused me as a after he professionally abused me, he was very nice. <laughs> yeah, sure. know, it, was, it wasn't it wasn't like, OK, Jay, well, great. Now, see you. No, you know. Come we'll do house. lunch, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it was just, but but he didn't he didn't want me to think that I was ready before I was, I guess. Yeah. And um, and then I finally, I think I knew I'd kind of done something when I played him a couple of songs, and he was like, 
well, let's go downstairs and uh, let's make a little bit better tape of a couple of these. And uh, and the kid running the tape tape room downstairs at the time was Chris Oglesby. Oh, He's now sorry. the big boss over at BMG. And so that's how yeah. I met Chris uh, way wow. back then. And uh, he was just the guy who was making tape copies and knew how to set up a microphone to make a work tape oh, at the Lord. time, you know. We all start somewhere. That's crazy. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Well, how long was it until your first cut when you first started, you know, kind of professionally writing songs and then what was your first cut? Um, you know, it was a, it was a while. I, I, I'd done that with, I'd done with Dave, I guess when I graduated college and I was, you know, pulling weeds and waiting tables for a year or so. And I, I got a, a publishing deal pretty quick uh, with a, a guy named Woody Bomar. It was yeah. Woody and um, Terry O'Neill had a company called Little Big Town which is where the band got their okay. name from them. Uh, but it was, so it was like Bob DePiro was there and John Scott Sherrill and Steve Seskin and uh, Kathy Majeski. It was a really, it was a, it was a very, very good group of, yeah. of writers to like show up and be the, like the little child around. Um, and the, the sort of the best thing Woody did, it was, I feel like when I was, there was, there was not a lot of people my age having writing deals who, who weren't also like, good looking and sang pretty and all that. I was just a, a weird dude who wanted to write songs. So <laughs> I, most of my peers at that time were, you know, 10 years older than me. Um, and Woody was very good because he did not, um, he, he said, you know, I can go and hook you up with all the hot writers right now of the moment, but I'm afraid that if I did that, he says, you're so young I and mean, you kind of really don't know what you're doing yet. Right. Like your thing is not baked in yet. So I'm afraid if I made you write you in two years, you would have a couple of hit songs, but then you would also be your career would be over by the time you were 27, because you would have learned to write songs in the style of the same guys who learned how to write songs in the eighties. Wow. And, and I want you to figure out your own thing first. And so I was writing a bunch by myself. And then he also, and then I just kind of like made some friends who were also writing songs and who were kind of at my same spot. And I wrote with Bob a little bit and Scotty a little bit. And, you know, I mean, it wasn't like I didn't do that, but right. most of my day to day was really just learning how to write songs with guys who were also learning how to write songs. And that's how I met Wynn Varble. And that's yeah. how I met um, Odie Blackman. And that's how I met Trent Summer. And a lot of the guys who were still like my best pals for writing, it was just those guys. And we all kind of taught each other how to do it. Um, wow. So I was, I, mean, I was getting paid. I just, it's funny, I was going through some stuff and I found my original contract and the amount of money I was getting paid was extraordinarily small, even for then, but <laughs> that's fine. I didn't, you know, um, you were young, you know, but, yeah, I was young and, you know, and, and, but I, uh, so I had, I went for four years with that deal and got uh, no cuts. And then they resigned me because that was, you know, I wasn't getting paid a bunch. That wasn't the thing. The idea was like they were trying to kind of grow me as a as a writer. Yeah. But within and within you know, so I resigned over there, uh, and then within a couple weeks or months, I had my first cut. You know, so they oh, they knew. You know, yeah. um, so I was a and it was on a, my first book country. My first my first first cut was actually that song that we played for Shell way back long ago. That uh, and then Raffi ended up recording it like a long about ten or fifteen years later. Um, it's called the gorilla song, but the, but the first kind of Nashville country hillbilly cut that I had on a thing was, uh, I think I wrote with a win, uh, called, um, self-made man it was on and it was on Montgomery Gentry's first record. That's awesome. And so, uh, that must've and, felt really good. It was super fun. It was, it was great to, to, to go in. And I remember going into the office over there at Sony records and tapes and then played it for us really loud and over a really good stereo. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is like records and things. And it was, very, it was, that was, uh, and then, and then I remember hearing it on the radio because it was a single briefly, you know, okay. It was in the twenties, but hearing it on the radio and at first thinking that I had left the tape in my car, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it didn't occur to me that it was the radio. I thought I was just, I was like, oh, I've heard this song three times. So I started to eject the tape. And then I was like, wait a minute, that's oh my gosh. A song. So that's amazing. You know, it was it was it at that moment, it kind of all sort of began to 
occur, you know. Yeah. To wow. some degree, whatever, however it occurs, you know, and then things go good and bad. But. What a wild story. Okay, so uh, let's dive into your songwriting process a little bit. Do mm-hmm. you write mm-hmm. by yourself or do you primarily co-write? What's your thing? I, it, over the last, I mean, well, I, whatever, if this has been normal lately, you know, uh, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, I have written a bunch by myself. When I first started writing, I wrote a bunch by myself, and then I really got into writing songs with people. And then I periodically sort of like go back to writing by myself sure. again. Just to, it, to flex that muscle. and Yeah, and, and yeah. Uh, in about five or six years, seven years ago, I really started, I kind of just decided I was going to write by myself almost like all the time. Yeah. Uh, and I, I got to where I just was tired of, I didn't feel like I was just doing, I wasn't doing my best work every day. And there were things I wanted to do that I yeah. wasn't quite getting done. And I was writing the best songs. I wasn't writing really good songs with other good songwriters because I was getting too, uh, yeah. and I was writing my best songs with people who weren't very good, but would just kind of sit there and be like, you're great, Jay, you're great, Jay, you're great. And that, <laughs> that's, that's, that's nice, but it's not the same thing as co-writing. Yeah. And so I just kind of got off to myself and, uh, and some of it was like an economic decision because it's hard to get songs cut. And if you write them by yourself and you get them cut, then you get all the money, you know, and that's, that happened a couple of times and that was nice. But, uh, but then it's also, that was also kind of as the, you know, everything was shifting toward mostly writing with artists was the main way to get songs cut too. And so I, you know, so, but it was really helpful for me for a few years to just to kind of get back into my own yeah. brain and my own way of doing things. And I would just kind of, Come, but, I, but I treated it like co-writing. I would just show up every day at 10 o'clock, work on my song, eat some lunch, finish the song, make a little tape. You know, it was, it was, uh, I, I really tried to not rely on, you know, kind of pie style, you know, inspiration at all. I just, I worked it like work. Well, that's um, interesting because I think we all start writing by ourselves mm-hmm. and we usually start when inspiration strikes. So I yeah. love that you actually like you kept to a schedule and you treated yourself as a co-writer. Treat yourself yeah. to lunch. Yeah, you know? no, I, th- I think I think once you especially once you get to co-writing, you can it can become a crutch yeah. because you have someone you to to bounce off of and someone who when you doubt yourself is like, no, you're the best and you think, oh, that's smart. And, you know, to, 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 you, you rely on that to kind of keep you going. Right. And so. The, I, I think the best way to write by yourself really is to like, and, and, I've, and I've talked to other folks too who, who've, who've done that and it's just like show up. I mean, a lot of times I would even set a timer. I would take, and that's when I started, I used, you know, I started off obviously writing on paper or with a pencil because that's about what you had mm-hmm. and then transferred to a computer. But when I was writing by myself, I realized the computer was a very dangerous object to right. have a room by yourself because then the next thing you know, you're learning about the migratory patterns of... <laughs> Yes. And, you know, and how that shifted with the industrial revolution or whatever. Yes. And so I got twice, took my computer and my phone and my, all my stuff and just set it over in that part of the room. And it was just me, paper, guitar, pencil. And I would set a timer for like two hours and be like, okay, two hours. And, yeah. and usually within that, you know, first 45 minutes I had wow. the bulk of a song done just because you don't realize how much having all these things coming at you. Yeah. 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 Well, it, just to dive into the detail, just because I'm curious now, when you would mm-hmm. sit down to do that, was it like stream of consciousness or was it like you had a hook in the back of your mind that you'd been wanting to work on and you'd make yourself? Some, some of both, some of both, you know, sometimes it would, I would, uh, I would have an idea or a little piece of a thing, but a lot of times it would just be me sitting and noodling mm-hmm. and just sort of trusting that something was going to come and yeah. just kind of like a little, and just being like, huh. And then what am I thinking about? What's in my brain? We're just trying to keep it, you yeah. know, was that an idea or what if I played this and just, and then, I mean, how, who know, whatever, like, I, I don't yeah. know, how to, whatever, whatever that thing is, I got to be, have a lot of faith in, in that, that thing, whatever That's that is. Very inspiring. I'm going to do that now. And I'm sure some of our viewers are going to as well. <laughs> um, well, talk to us about co-writing then. Why is co-writing important and what do you look for in a co-writer? Um, yeah, it sounds like I'm dog and co-write, which I'm not at all. Like it's Apples the best. Apples and oranges. Uh, yeah, it's it's like a totally different thing, and and uh, I think um, a lot, of, especially I think I think early on, the real value of co-writing is uh, you just it's a, you're learning how to do it from each other. Like I said, like that's like Odie and 
and Trent and Wynn and I guess the names I'm thinking of just because I said them, but I like I had a friend named Doug Sneed and a guy named who was an old Texas guy and a guy named Dre Benstra who was kind of a cool guy and, and we would just you know kind of showed each other everything we'd figured out about how to do this thing yeah. and and introduced each other to the people who we'd met and the friends we'd made and the, the players and the stuff and so that was the, a lot of that early on is just just the learning how to do it at all um I think as you go sometimes you rely on it to like goose your old tired bones into something new um but uh I think now I I, I enjoy it it's I, I like hmm sometimes it's just like having a bonus which one is it left brain right brain the one that comes up with the, the creative part list, you're right, right hand, it's this one. So it's like this one, whatever. I don't know. But just having like a whole, like, I like co-writers who think out loud okay. because then it's like having extra, yeah. an extra brain. It's not my brain. And like, we're, we're sort of like talking through things and just yes. saying things. It's kind of talking and listening at the same time. Like stream of be, consciousness. Just get it Yeah. Out. And then all of a sudden, like, you just said that word and this is the thing. And oh well, what in, in grabbing bits and pieces of each other's brains seems to be a really that that that's really exciting yeah. and interesting and then you know as I get older uh seeing the way younger people you know they have their their musical world is really different than mine and some yeah. of the things they pick up on and and I'm I'm fortunate enough like I have a, a sister who's a good bit younger than me and at first I would steal like her music and then I had about it when she, when she got old enough that her music was tired like I had a daughter who was interested in cool music and so like it's like I keep I kind of try to stay attached to what's going on right. but not necessarily what's going on in like contemporary Nashville hillbilly country music but what's going on just in the world of musical stuff yeah what people are into yeah yeah the sounds. And, and, and the sounds and the noises and and things um just to kind of keep me excited about yeah making up stuff right um, so that's to me, that's what uh, having somebody to write with. I mean, I'd like to say I can write by myself. I functionally know how to like start with a hook and make it end up with a song at the end. At the you know that's 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 not hard to right. me anymore, just because I've done it a bunch. But right. to have somebody do something that is like, why would you do it like that? Oh, yeah. okay, that's cool. Well, I guess that's how our song goes now because I don't yeah. understand why, but now it does. And then you know that. That to me uh, is, is, uh, is, is always, that's the new fun. And that's the fun of, of making a new friend. And, and uh, maybe that's the magic of it too, is that you can't really explain why two people getting together could make it more special, but it can. Yeah. 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 And that's the thing is, and it really, I've yet to uh, figure out why some people, you know, if there's people who I, as, as humans, I care for them deeply, but if we get in a room to write a song together, I just want to stab them in the eye with a pencil. <laughs> And there's yeah. people who, if we started talking too long about too many things that are on the internet, we might get in a fight, but that's not the same thing as whatever that Venn diagram of love or certain kinds of music or uh, whatever it's, you know, whatever that thing is that, that, yeah. that is the thing that, that y'all are sharing at that moment is the, is the deal. It's such an interesting world. There's nothing else like the the music and songwriting world. It's fascinating. No, it's very, it's very strange. Well, in in your experience, you have a lot of experience. How does a young songwriter make impressions on on bigger songwriters they want to get in the room with and publishers? What mm -hmm. is the best way to to make a good impression? Ah, I, I think for uh, being, it's weird. I mean, this is probably not. This is. I think people say a lot I would imagine is just being cool mm -hmm. and not like cool like uh, you're Fonzie or whatever not like and, and not like we're dressing in the way you're being but just being somebody who is easy to spend time around because that's so much of what all of this is is and so, so somebody who listens but also has something to say and someone who you can handle being in a room with uh because in a way like writing a song with somebody is kind of like a going on a road trip yeah. with somebody and it's like do I really want to be locked in a car with this person all the way to California like man yeah, I'd be fine you know we've got some good jams and we'll have some snacks and yeah. some conversation like 
that piece of it, a lot of times I think, uh, I think uh, trying too hard to impress or, or thinking you're already cooler than you are, like those are the two things that annoy me and my friends probably more than anything. And if it's just like, man, they're just, they're great. They come, they showed up, they're fired to be here. You know, I think uh, that, that piece of it uh, is much more and, and, uh, and, and being open. I'm like, like to me, it's the same thing that makes that I, that I try to bring when I'm writing songs, which is just sort of an openness and a willingness to learn from the other person what it is they have to teach me about how to write songs. I think that's goes both ways. And so as long as y'all are kind of open to each other. Yeah. But that's that interesting. I, th- I think not a lot of people are as, as humble and open as you, especially when you've got a, an extensive resume, like you're still learning. And I really admire that you, you say that in your life. Oh, I can yeah. learn something from you too. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's, uh, that's the whole, that's the whole trick. I think that's the key to, um, uh, to want to, to, to being able to, and do it, let's just to want to do this job for that long, right. you know, cause, uh, you know, you can get real, it's, it's easy to get cranky about <laughs> all of it. If you want to be, you know, sure. and I, and I remember when I first got to the point where I could start writing with guys who, uh, had been the people who I'd learned how to write songs from by listening to their songs, you know, yeah. and, and, right. and some of them were great and some of them were not because they were mad because it was not 1987 anymore and nobody cared about their songs anymore. And here they were stuck in the room, right? With some punk kid who, you know, from Nashville with glasses and I, well, I ought to be writing with the guy, you know, like you could tell like all of that just bothered them yes. that they were, that, 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 you know, and, uh, and then there was guys, you know, like I, my favorite of that is like Rory Burke, who was exactly the opposite of that. Rory was just like so, always just, he claims he used to be kind of a jerk and I, which is hilarious to me, uh, but he just is open to it and he's fired up and he just, you know, from for decades, just as excited to be in a room making up songs. And so I try to, to take that as my, I can't so, imagine him ever being a jerk. I know, he's I the know. Sweetest like, guy in the world. I know. He was like, he said, "Oh yeah, I used to be a real jerk." I'm like, oh, you no, did. he did it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but maybe he was. I don't know. But 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 he just he just had that. I was like, that's the way you you know have this job for that long is to always be open to what the next thing is and what the thing. And you and I and I have my own personal beliefs about what's good and what's bad. You can't let go of that because that's what your own thing comes from. But you don't need to be like, man, this is thing, and we used to, because it just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make anybody want to talk about love and put a melody to it, and that's the the object of a day, ultimately. Love that. That's going to be our sound bite. Talk about love and put a melody to it. <laughs> Let's love it. Um, okay. Well, you've had. Uh, experiences at working with numerous publishers in Nashville in as much or as little detail um, as you're comfortable with, what do you take away from working with different companies? Um, I think that, uh, you know, there's like the, there's big places and small places. It's kind of the easy, the easy, the kind of the main breakdown. I think that uh, they both have advantages to, you know, to where you, to, depending on where you are in your career you know, I think big places can, uh, they can, they have, you know, they're a giant battleship. And so when it's, it's time to start firing those guns, they get it done and they can, they can get it done sure. in a way that a small place can't because they, they're the place. And if somebody's looking to make a record, the last three places they stop is Sony and uh, Universal and uh, whatever the other one is it's called. Now. I don't, you know, but it's like, yeah. that's the thing. So there's a real plus to that. The minus to that is that it's a giant battleship. And if you're not up there, if you're not someone who's willing and able to go up there and be like, hey, me, hey, me, hey, me, in a way that doesn't make them upset, you know, doesn't annoy everyone, right? Uh, you can disappear really easily. Um, uh, but in a small place, you know, and, and the other thing about a big place, and this is kind of the, the real difference I'd say as I talk around this, uh, if, if, they, if I get signed at Sony and they don't turn me into a star. That's fine. You know, that I'm not, that me as a project is not as important to them as 
individual songs. They just need to get songs and songs and songs and get them cut and get them on the radio, get things and get them placements. Other. So because they always have this sort of an endless supply of songs and writers kind of coming through. Yeah. Whereas if you sign at a, a newer place or a smaller place, like the only way they're really going to succeed ultimately is to take those individual writers and turn them into uh, important people yeah. within the community because that's that's their thing because they're not they're not going to get somebody coming to them all the time looking for songs but if they manage to take somebody who's kind of on their way up and turn them into a, a thing right then everybody's going to stop by on the way because they well they got jay Knowles over there we got yeah, jay Knowles here. like that's, <laughs> that's that's you know uh the object of that um but i would say that uh either at either place the most important thing is just to have someone who works there want to make you be a country music songwriting star and as long as you have somebody there whether it you know it can be somebody who just quit working in the tape room and now they got to make their bones it could be the boss it could be you know somebody in the middle somebody one of the, the superstar song plugger over it that you know it does it doesn't you know it, it does that, but I think if you've got to have you know somebody there who who really yeah. believes in you and not just because your lawyer cut the best deal with their <laughs> lawyer kind of a yeah. thing or you got you know it's, it really has to be a personal a champion um, yeah yeah, yeah some, that, that thing seems to trump all other concerns at that point you know yeah and, so uh, and big company but small company it really doesn't matter you just got to find your people find your people because a small it's kind of like you know new york city is a big city but it's also a bunch of little neighborhoods you know and i think <laughs> you know sony tony i call, I call it sony tree because i'm old sony <laughs> is the same way it's a big company but there's tom luner and there's you know thing and there's Emory, the head, there's all those people and that's you know those those are the little neighborhoods and if you can if you got your person over there then they'll fight for you because they care you know and they know that if they fight they win you win we win. Everybody wins. So, yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of, of industry folks and all of that, tell mm -hmm. everyone about whale farm because I'm absolutely fascinated by this. Um, tell everyone about whale farm. Yeah. It's, it's an idea. Um, it's funny. I had a, a friend of mine who knows nothing about the music business. Initially he didn't, he was a, he's like an entrepreneur startup kind of a guy more, mostly in healthcare. He's, he's a friend and I had, uh, his, his, he and I both had uh, kids in school together. And, um, and I was explaining to him how song writing, just the business of it works and how you write songs and then you go around and you're playing for people, all the stuff, that we, you know, all know that part. But he was just like, that sounds like terrible. <laughs> like, you know, you know, like, how do you, and none of it, it doesn't work and it's super inefficient. You know, he's putting like businessman brain on it. And he's like, well, what would you do to like fix that? You know, and I just kind of, as we were talking, uh, kind of came up with this idea. And then over the next several years, we've um, we kind of workshopped it. And I went out and talked to people in different parts of the business and uh, and then ended up having somebody kind of put the, you know, coders and all that kind of stuff in the eye. And now the real idea is that there's a bunch of songs, as we know, that don't get to see the light of day for whatever reason, right. but they're like the best songs. They've just, but it gets harder and harder to, have so if you write a song with one artist and it ends up not making their project because it ends up not quite fitting what they do or just yeah. for whatever reason or they change producers or and then but it's still a great song and you can kind of pitch it but there's so many of those opportunities are getting fewer and further between and um and so the idea is that it's a place where uh people can take those kinds of songs that just hadn't quite found their home yet and you put them on there and then everybody who was a a member of whale farm and and it's you know it's 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 not for like beginner songwriters or beginner right. people it, it really is it is really is for established people so you know when you go over there that these songs are at least vetted by that right. process that it's, it's, they're pre-vetted by the town because you have to kind of be yeah. a member of the community to get in um but then uh you can go in and you can listen to the songs and and initially you don't see who wrote it or any of that kind of stuff because um that shouldn't that's not that's not a part of the thing yeah. but as you listen you if you like it you give it a thumbs up and if you don't like it you can give it a thumbs down if you really like it you can contact the whoever had uploaded the song and say hey i like your song and then, so you get an email from them saying hey so and so cares about your song 
and um, and then you can kind of take it from there. But also over time, with all the thumbs ups and thumbs downs, the the hope is that uh, you know the good songs sort of rise to the top, and the ones that aren't quite as beloved go away. But it becomes another way to or just it's just a way to to hopefully you know help songs get found because there's so many of them and there's hard drives piled with them yeah. and most of them are just okay because it's hard to write a good song yeah. but even the great ones get lost in in that mush and i think you said so. that very well that very very well <laughs> <laughs> very well in your in the video that's on the whale farm website which i think it was you wasn't it in the voiceover yeah yes, yes. it was so good it was well written <laughs> and your voice is you've got like the perfect voice for like a southern <laughs> southern charm and it was just great so i love i love what you're doing i hope to be on there one day and 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 part of the crew but the um the the vetting process i guess is what i'm curious about is mm -hmm. it you is it like a like a committee of people i'm just curious yeah, yeah right at, at this moment it is me okay basically and it's just like and if somebody kind of shows up I'm like, do, do I know you? Who are you? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like it's right. a just because it's as we're in this kind of the early phases right. of becoming a thing. Yeah. Uh, and um eventually there'll probably be a, a more yeah uh, systematized system. Um it's really but it's cool. a lot about just being cool and being in the in the club. Sorry. I don't mean I don't mean like that. <laughs> no, but it's, it's, it's like a but but that's but that's that, that's what keeps that's why you know there's people from record labels and there's people from yeah. big publishers who are willing to participate is because they know they go there it's right. not going to be like showing up at an open mic exactly and have everyone come running at them i totally yeah. get it i think it's a great idea and and there's already thousands and thousands and thousands of great songs like you said and there's thousands more being written every day and i think we need we need more whale farms and and more like towns inside the small city like you're exactly saying, you know? exactly yeah, i love exactly. it it's brilliant that's awesome yeah no it's been it's been fun to 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 to, to learn I learned a lot of new things about the business and other businesses as a result of, I bet. of, of messing with it. To, this yeah. is what happens when you we start doing all these side projects is you give yourself yeah. more work, but you know, you learn yeah. a, a no, lot along the it, way. It, it, you do, you do. That's awesome. Well, okay. Tell me about how Nashville has changed. How long, you know, since you started, how is Nashville and how has the industry changed? Um, I would say, um, Probably the, the biggest changes have happened in the last pretty small amount of time. You know, I mean, really? the, the way Nashville was in the 70s when I was like a little, when we moved here when I was a little kid in the 80s and 90s and even the early 2000s was kind of, it wasn't, it was just kind of what it was. I think the things that have changed lately, some of it, to me, it's like it's, it's like cultural within the town of that's been caused by kind of the geography shift yeah. in Music Row, and so like you know for the longest time, those two two three streets was like a little mini college campus where we all just lived and worked, and we didn't live, but we all worked. We you know right. we all worked there, and there were those little restaurants that uh, were kind of where we always ate and the bars where everybody hung out. And that was it. And there was a little kind of outpost on Berry Hill, but, but that was, you know, it was, that was it. And so uh, it encouraged a sort of a communal uh, conviviality, I guess. And so like, you know, if you were, somebody was looking for songs, I mean, I remember her talking about like, like AR people who would just like, they would meetings, but just like go down the street, just walk in, walk in, listen, go. And that was kind of part of the deal yeah. is, and so everybody kind of knew each other more um, uh, and I think that when you go from that to everybody emailing each other songs and uploading and downloading and stuff, and then yeah. you, which, you know, well, farm, it was almost an attempt to kind of like, uh, counteract that because now, because that, uh, was trying to kind of bring everybody into one place mm -hmm. as opposed to everybody's email. And then now everybody's kind of moved up to different parts of town and, some of the record labels are downtown and some of the stuff yeah. and some of the publishers they're down in Franklin. And then some of them are kind of based at a count. It's like, it feels, and now, we, and now, uh, like when you write with somebody, they're like, okay, well come to my place and write. And used to, that meant was it 16th Avenue or 17th Avenue. And usually right. I would just park at my publisher and put my guitar and walk. just walk to wherever it was. And now they're like, 
oh yeah, it's in Fairview. And I'm like, okay, now which one's Fairview again? And I go, oh crap, that's an hour away. Right. It's just, it's just what it is. Or some part of town that as a native of Nashville, I never would have even, you know, thought to go to because it was, I mean, now we're, uh, my, my office now is over in, uh, over in that behind the old sound stadium back in that, where they call it WeHo, which I don't call it that because that's not <laughs> what I call it, you know, but, um, but, you know, used to, that was rough. And now it's got all the little publishing companies and coffee shops and Pilates studios and, and you just go there. And so, but it's, so it's nice, but, but it, everything's more fragmented. Yeah. And, and that's, I think the thing. Which is like uh, a little yeah. sad, but you also don't want to just sit around and, and be, you know, sad over progress. Cause it's, that's you know, right. Cause yeah. yeah. And, and I think, cause yeah, I was thinking, uh, I was talking to somebody recently and, you know, used to like the bar for recording was very high. You had to have, you know, you know, a publisher who would pay for demos and a thing in a big studio. And you had to have $800 to at least to like make a decent thing. And, right. and there's things about that that are nice, but, you know, I kind of think ultimately that meant that like the gatekeepers could kind of keep the gates up and only let them down for their own, you know, as, as right. the, as the community gets more diverse and it used to be just a bunch yeah. of white guys from the South. That's, that was country music yeah. for the most part. And then it was a couple of white ladies from the South. And then, but then now and you, it's like it, because the technology bar is much lower and you just got to have garage band and know how to use a computer. Right. Then it becomes a thing that becomes allowable for lots of other people. And you're seeing it in the, in, you know, yeah. the country music now, that's just a bunch of different folks from different places for different reasons are coming and participating in this deal. Yeah. So as much as I miss everything be, being all in a nice fancy room with fancy, you know, gear, <laughs> the world's greatest pickers, it's kind of great that now it can also be lots of other different people, because I think that, that ultimately is what's going to make this thing that we're making here in this town continue to be something that's worth, yeah. you know, worth doing. Yeah. Absolutely. Accessi to, accessibility, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the upside of the, of the downside to me. And, and it's worth it. <laughs> You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, things are always going to change. So again, yeah. no sense in, in pouting about it. You know, nope. it's nope. it's all it's all good stuff. Um. Yeah. Okay. So tell me real quick, what do you do? Uh, uh, you're obviously a very disciplined songwriter, but what do you do if you're not feeling inspired? Oh, um. Sometimes I just sit there. Most <laughs> of the time is what I do. Um. I uh, you know if I'm if I'm kind of having a a, a a stretch where I'm not having much fun. I mean, that's where co-writing really is, uh, is the blessing because you just, every day it's a different little group of folks and a different somebody and a different thing. And they have a thing going on. And, and that's where you kind of rely on just sort of your, your skill craft that you have as a result of having done it a bunch. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think a lot of times it, it, I don't, how do I say this? Used to, I would have dry spells where I don't have any ideas or I can't write any songs or I don't really know what to do. Or, but I just, that's not a thing for me anymore. And it's not because uh, I'm like all of a sudden have all these more ideas or anything. It's just like, kind of like I was saying before, it's like, I just kind of trust that if I just sit there long enough and don't not write a song, yeah. Then, then I'll write a song. Yeah. And it may not be great, but that's it fine. It have to be. Not most, everything. Most, most, yeah. yeah. And it's and 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 the other thing, and, and, and uh, Adam Wright, who's one of my good buddies and one of my favorite songwriting pals, we realized at some point several years ago that once you have done this enough times and you have enough, you know, skills, even if the song is just okay. If you just kind of like squint at it long enough and move enough parts around and fix this and this and that and that, it gets pretty good. And, and it doesn't really, you know, it's like it doesn't have to be like the greatest idea in the history of the world or whatever. It's really just about starting and doing your best to make it be good. And as long as you sort of, as long as uh, you don't make beginning to be the hardest part. I think maybe that's maybe that's my answer to your question. I think a lot of people get stuck because they're like, where do I start? What's my hook? What's my thing? It's like, we'll figure that out while we're, you know, you can kind of, it's a little bit like jumping out of a, 
airplane and then packing your parachute. It's like, okay, <laughs> worst, the worst things that happen is that we just hit the ground and it goes yeah. flat. But, you know. <laughs> Get out of your own way. I think yeah, it's, it's yeah. basically what you're saying. I love that. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, okay, so I, I have, I, I could talk to you all day. I just looked at the clock. Dang. Okay. Well, I want to hear stories of all of your, all of your hits, all of your songs. But I told you personally that I love Half Drunk by Charlie Worsham, and I would love uh -huh. to personally know the story behind that song. Oh, I'm trying to remember. You know, it's funny. Like I've been a Charlie and I have been people who have supposed to have written together for a very long time. Since he first started, I knew like a lot of those folks and I almost wrote, but we never did until um, until probably shortly before the 2020 shutdown times, oh, wow. about, about six months or so before that, we kind of we met and started to write songs and, and immediately we we're just like, OK, yeah, this we're pals, this is happening, <laughs> we're guitar nerds, and he's but he's just good at it. And we were, were nerds and we, you know, and all that we could just talk about anything. And um, but I remember just my sort of goal and I don't know I didn't ever say that out loud to Charlie because I didn't want to get in his head was just like I just want to write some love songs <laughs> with Charlie like I want him to write he's got you know and that's the thing is he'd, written, he'd recently gotten married and he was in love and all this and, and I just like I just want him to write some songs about how much he loves being in love with a pretty girl you know who he just got married to and and um and then he had that that idea just that little that that half drunk half uh, what is it half joke and half crazy mm -hmm. and I was like yeah I like that because it's that's the spot where I live in songs a lot too mm -hmm. is that sort of ambivalence about being an idiot uh <laughs> you know and because that's really what the song is about is like, yeah. like well whoops I just did this thing well here we go you know yeah. and yeah. uh and I just remember uh the song itself came to together pretty quickly uh because we knew what it was about and we knew yeah. that guy and we were, we were, cause we kind of both are that guy. <laughs> and so it was not hard to put ourselves in the, but, and, you know, and I think he was, you know, come from the standpoint of really thinking about like, what was that moment like when yeah. he was, he was closer to that. I've been married for a very long time. So that's a, that's further back in the past, but it's still something I relate to is that yeah. here we go uh, kind of moment. And so, I don't know if that's really helpful about like the, 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 the building of it, you know, we were just, cause we were just having a, having a nice time and we had that line, uh, you know, have you have you crazy from day one, you've been the one babe. We were just kind of playing with the words of it. Here we go. Uh, da -da -da, just cause I didn't want to say what I meant when it hundred percent. And, uh, and we had, it was kind of groovy and he goes, you know, the folks, at the label really like it when I sing high, I'm like, okay. And we go, I love you. That was just, that was oh, it. And like, you know, like we needed, we needed a Charlie Worsham yep. moment. And, and, you know, you're a fan. I'm a fan. Of course you love it when he goes, ah, that's, yeah, that's, that's the the label's right. <laughs> yeah, they're exactly correct. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was like, well, yeah. And then you so sing high. And, and what, is, what is the best thing in the world to sing up high is I love you because that's the best, the whole thing. And so oh, we just did that. And, so cool. but it was, but I, but it was just, uh, I mean, all, always writing with Charlie is uh, is fun like that, and it's sometimes it's a challenge because he he really wants things to be, you know, he's not someone who's just like, yeah, that's cool, that's cool. Is that, what do you think? And he's just like he really wants to, to get in there, yeah. and, uh, and he always and it's he'll always call up about a day later. Like, How about I'm messing with it, and what do you think about this? <laughs> and and, uh, and then I usually I'll go you and it's it's. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to because I said it to him. Is he does this thing where he hits a good song, and then his first round of fixes, I'm like, I think he's like wrecking our song. <laughs> and then he'll call back like two days after that, and he'll fix his fixes, <laughs> and then it'll be part. It'll be magic, you know. What I mean, it's just like you see him, his his brain and his thing, and it's so good that he just. But he's not, he doesn't, it's not just like, well, it's fine. We know nobody cares. Yeah. He is, he is the exact opposite of that. He really just, that's why so much of what he does is so good. Cause he really just, he wants it to be. We need, rocking. we need more of that. Yeah. We need no, it's more great. It's that's great. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you sharing because I, I mean, I've, I'd heard of Charlie for a long time, but I didn't discover him till the sugar cane era. So this brand uh -huh. new era. Uh -huh. Um, But I like, Personally, it was, you know, 2021 last year, and it had been a really rough time for mm -hmm. everybody, but especially Nashville writers and artists who like had a lot going on and then everything shut down. It was crazy. And 
it the whole EP and that song in particular came when I really needed some inspiration and it just like hit hit me on the freeway and I was like what is this and the (laughs) and the I love high part Uh I was like what is this so right (laughs) yeah for sharing because that that is a special place in my heart now because I I was inspired after that after being a little down that morning so anyway I love it thank you for sharing that makes Um, me feel good okay um I know I'm gonna let you go in just a second tell us about song friends Oh yeah, um, I is a, a new thing I've been working on. Uh, I found this uh, thing called Substack, which is a newsletter platform, uh, and I'm always just kind of trying to come up with ways to uh, use the things I've learned from writing songs. That's what Whale Farm came from. That is like I know all this stuff from sitting down every day and making up songs about love. What's another thing? And uh, I've always really enjoyed writing, writing. I was, I was an English major in college. And so I like to write long form writing and stories and things. And, um, and so this, uh, this newsletter thing I've been working on the last, I guess the, the three, we're, we're, you know, three or four or five into it now um, is every couple of weeks, I just write a thing that is occurring to me that week uh, about, and it's about the, the thing, the idea is it's things I've learned uh, f- as a result of writing songs and so it's not necessarily how to write songs or about songs it maybe is and it kind of comes from that because that's what I do yeah. but it's more the things my friends and I have it's it's a lot of it's it's, it's conversations like this is what it really is it's it's the things you talk about while you're writing songs that helps you write songs um, it's really great I think it's that uh, unique angle that makes it really great I've enjoyed them well, I'm glad, yeah, because it's really, it's, it's for songwriters, but it's also for people who just like music. It's for aspiring songwriters, but it's also for people who've been doing it a long time. And it's also for people who like writing and people who just like yeah. silliness. Um, uh, but it's it's been fun. It's been fun to, to write them and fun to kind of get the feedback from people when they suck. They say they seem to, to like it. And, it uh, so. It's really enjoyable and informative. And it um, now that we've officially met, I can, I can say that it has your voice to it. So that's, your true yeah, that's and that's and that's a, that and that's a really what I that's the thing I've worked working on most of all is just to kind of make it sound like hanging out with Jay. And if you yeah. don't like, then you're you if you don't like hanging out with me, you're really not gonna like it. <laughs> but that's that's fine. I, I accept that. Well, how uh, do people subscribe to it? Uh, if you go to uh, you can um, go to songfriends.substack.com. Is that their website? Or you can email me. Uh, at uh, what is my whatever my email is mm-hmm. j at uh, was it j at djnoles.com mm-hmm. which is my my kind of work email uh, or um, or just find me on uh, Instagram and you can go through the little linky link thing link tree oh, thing slide so, into your DMs yeah, exactly yeah. Or, 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 or or link in bio is that what the kids link- say yeah. yeah yeah here's a link in bio you click on that and you just give me your email and then you become part of the list. Um, and, uh, and that's it right now. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't really have a, a master plan of why I'm doing it other than it's fun. Uh, yeah. Those that are seems the best the best things. yeah. And then who knows what, you know, I, like you're doing this. Why, why not? Because it's fun. Because <laughs> I it, enjoy it. Makes, it. Yeah. yeah it, it makes it be a thing that other than grinding through the day. So exactly. Well, you've, you've done so many cool things. What is, next for you like what do you still want to do besides everything you're doing (laughs) yeah um i really i just want to make up songs some more you know it's weird is that i think like i say back when i kind of did the thing where i was just writing a bunch by myself i think i was kind of bummed out by making songs a little bit just because i've been doing it for so long and yeah but which i get which which can happen and that's fine as long as you don't bum everybody else out the process but (laughs) now i just really like making up songs and learning new ways to make up songs i like making up songs with new people i still want to you know write a song that makes the whole world sing yeah you know uh and and helps you know bring world peace or you know makes people dance or whatever the thing is that songs can do at any given time like that 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 dumb simple thing you know, it's it, uh, but mainly I just uh, want to um, have fun writing a song tomorrow. Is that's you know, if I can kind of keep the process be interesting and fun and making new friends and keeping the old, like, yeah, that's it. 
that's it. You know, that sounds, that, sounds, that sounds like a small, that sounds like small, but, uh, but it's really kind of, that's all there is to me. It's just that daily enjoying of, of doing it. That is all there is at the end of the day. There's, there's your happiness and trying to do good. You know, yeah. I think yeah. hopefully you're doing both. I think you're doing good. So hopefully you're happy. <laughs> well, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking like an hour of your day to talk with us. I oh, know wow, that that's good, yeah. I know. And yeah, I, I'm, I know I'm not the only one who's going to enjoy this is all well, I was going to say. I, I enjoyed it because it's hard, you know, I don't think anybody complains about sitting around talking about themselves for an hour. So. <laughs> it wasn't just about you though. It's all of your experiences and, yeah, and all of nah. this insight and, <laughs> and, you know, people can take workshops all day long, but there's something about just getting firsthand stories like this that are just yeah. really valuable. So yeah. thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And we'll, maybe we'll do it again sometime uh, after you've got more number ones and hits under your belt. That's fine. Yeah, that'd be great. I would, I would love to have to have to do that. <laughs> All right, Jay, thank you so much. We'll see you later. All right, talk to you.